every angel taking up shifts and making this possible. Thank you. So my name is Lucas, and I would like to present you um, Zenzo community. And here you see our mission statement. So I will start with this one. So Zenzo community is a contributors-driven global Zenzo network that creates open environmental data. So it is really driven by individuals that are passionate about nature, health, environment. And they see the need that it is important to first have a network that is generating the data that can be then openly made available and be used in many, many, many different ways. And what um, ways, we will come later to some of these examples. So our mission is to inspire and enrich people's life by offering a platform for the collective curiosity in nature that is genuine, joyful, and positive. So um, we'll switch now over to the map, actually, because this is what uh, it's all about. It started with just the desire of local people having a visualization of how is the situation regarding air quality now. If you are in a city and there is a newspaper article stating that the official stations had reached values that are crossing much above such values of being compared to cities like Beijing and Shanghai, which are both equally like above 20 million people, it makes you kind of like nervous. <laughs> and you think, OK, um, and when was this measured? Oh, that was some time ago. So I already have been impacted, and I didn't know. And when this appears, um, there was like in our South German uh, city, Stuttgart, the group was forming and thought like, how about we contact the official institution and ask them about the values and the data to create a map, like you can see now, right, on display it under maps.sensor.community. Just with the interest of having a live visualization of the values that is easy accessible from all devices, to be informed. <laughs> Sounds simple. <laughs> It wasn't too simple to create this at the beginning. So the institutions, they <clears throat> it's kind of new for them when they request uh, from citizen. So they say, like, yeah, we don't give such data out. And then you come around the corner as a citizen say, like, yeah, there is a European directive, European law. Um, yeah, we should have it. And then the citizen receive an email from the institution with a PDF. It's not a machine-readable format, with values that are like six months old. <laughs> And then you have a lot of email ping pong, and you get until the stage that you have emails in your inbox with a PDF, again, with values that are three months old. So that's not really a good start for creating a live visualization map. Then the group formed and thought about, like, okay, what is out there in the world? What kind of sensors do exist? We have here people from hackerspace. We have different groups that organize, come in, come out. We have a lot of knowledge that you can gather. Let's, this, let's make this a topic, right? So people came together, and we had different solutions. And then we found, like, there is a sensor available. And there are several, actually, sensors at the beginning that have been tested. So. The connection is like you order them online, you make them work in hacker style, right? So it's like it's giving you the data, you can store it somewhere, and then you have something that you can create a visualization, a map. So that, that was the beginning of the idea. At that time, there was like the movie 300 Warriors, very famous. So how about setting up a goal to having 300 sensors for your city, right? <laughs> so going to a conference with experts and asking them for their opinion and their input, and the outcome was um, they laugh about you, they say you are crazy, uh, you will never make it. That was a nice statement. <laughs> um, and their experience was that actually they have been already projects um, funded with millions of euros trying do do the same, and after the period of time, they shut down. They had maximum like 13 stations installed, if at all. So coming around the corner as a new group and stating we will do 300, maybe sounded a little bit high of a reach for them. But uh, the initial group did what they said. They ran a crowdfunding campaign, so the initial funding was given. And they bought these devices, installed them, rolled them out around the city, and these devices measured air quality and started generating data. 
And then, especially what was super important from the beginning, there was like the focus on privacy, right? So it's like separating the data from the people when they register, also having the approach that what you don't ask them about, you don't have to even care about. So it's like ask them as little as only possible, but still have a connection feedback back that let's say the sensor stops sending data, you can still contact them, make them aware of it. After the privacy comes the openness about the open data and making it accessible, right? So it's like that whatever you measure, make it available as open data in an archive, as historical data. And then also, of course, from the beginning in the hackerspace, people were asking like, um, will you make an API? Will you make it available? So of course, someone stepped in, said like, yeah, that's possible, absolutely. So there was an API. And then, of course, once you have it and you received it as a collective, to make it visible, right? To make it a map and display the values, the life values, actually, to the people. So the idea was born, and it was like realized quite quickly. And when you set up something like this for just 300 sensors for one city, then you don't think a lot about automatization or scalability. <laughs> and you can allow yourself to do a lot manually. So that means people registered per email. And then Raiko, for example, was like really copy and pasting into the database because we thought like we have a fixed amount, right? After 300 times, it will be done. But People liked it, and it worked very well. So they shared this idea and the approach with their friends, and not only in other cities, but very quickly also in other countries. So very soon after that, we didn't have like, to deal with 300, but let's say with over 4,000 stations that people wanted to register. And it was like in seven countries. And then a great example was like the strength of the community. So Peter from the Netherlands, uh, he was a former um, production um, um, engineer at Siemens. So he spoke a lot, very good German. He understood our project and he translated it into Dutch and just played it back, said like, hey guys, nice project, I like it. I have a sense of myself. Here is a Dutch translation. How about adding it to your website. And we thought like, wow, what's a great idea, right? So very quickly, this was a great example that others followed. And through the power of community, we've been able to focus on the tech side. And the community was adding like new translations and also corrected if there was a mistake because everything was already linked on GitHub and made accessible how we set it up and how everything works. So with this approach, it escalated further because it was just a um, milestone with this 4,000 stations. I mentioned it because at that point we sat together and thought like, okay, it seems there is more need than just our city. And we're receiving so many emails from people all around the world with trying to set up something very similar or basically the same. And they're asking us if they can take the approach and run it on a local level. We had a lot of conversations, and what we understood is that if this should work, we need three layers of adoption. It's like basically we from the core team in South Germany, Stuttgart, can't go everywhere in the world, so we can take only about the first step, and that is like the language aspect, right? So it's like we put a lot of effort into thinking how we set it up the system differently to have this translation, different languages in a much smoother way, right? Much easier, automatic and accessible and fast. So we started basically, um, yeah, at the beginning we had a German name for the project. It was really like German air quality project focus activity. And then we came into this like transition phase, right? Where we saw like that so many stations, so many requests out of Germany in other countries. And we have to sit down and we have to rethink what we are and what we do. So the discussion went that way that we thought, OK, it's all about sensors. There is hardware involved. There is software involved. The firmware is open source. Then we have the data, the open data as an outcome. But in this discussion, we realized that actually it is all about the links with other groups, other projects that made us um, like so successful because we always had like a situation where we um, endeavored some troubles like let's say a scale up, a change from one server to another, having a better tool implemented and we didn't have all the knowledge in our little local group, right? So always someone did know someone else and let them know about our discussions and then always at the right moment the right person went through the door and said like, yeah, I do that in my daily job, that's not a problem at all, I will show you how it goes, right? And then 
they maybe like work at, let's say, a big corporation and deal with server clusters in a day job, but at the evening, they supported our activities with code and really good um, support. And through that, it was possible to grow in activities and also in scope. So actually, we decided to have a renaming because the German air quality local approach was not working for others in other countries. And we did a total transition. So basically, we started from scratch again. We took a blank sheet and we said, OK, how about if we don't have this German local approach, but this like rather a global first approach for all sorts of open environmental data, right? But we will still start with what we are most famous about, like the air quality network, and make this as a good example so others can see about the dynamic, how to approach a certain topic and how to translate it to other topics. So that is basically the result, what you see in front of you. That's now sensor.community. And what we see in here is a collection of a network of currently 14,300 sensors that are measuring every two and a half minutes. And basically, these devices are as small as my hand palm. And they are waking up, they are doing their thing. Um, the inlet is going, like, taking up in uh, air. It goes through the chamber. There is a little laser beam. It detects the size of the particles. Uh, they are defined as particular matter 10 and particular matter 2.5. 10 is a size that stuck in your lungs and has already a health impact. And in the 2.5 particulars, they are even smaller. They go through your lung in your blood circulation and then get in touch with more organs. So you can, in general, take away from this session that the smaller the particles, the bigger the health impact it is. And remember that it doesn't stop with particular matter 2.5. There are even particular matter 1. And then there are like ultra fine particles, right? So. We had to make a very complex topic more accessible. And there is one more thing to mention here, Worf, that in Europe, they're still having mostly the focus on PM10, while in the global scope of science, there is the focus already on PM2.5. There are much many more um, part, um, papers written and approaches. So we thought, like, OK, let's change this approach of our network. So that was like all the reason we needed a sensor that is very well in measuring this particles 2.5, and here we are. So currently, with this network of 14,300 stations, they are located in around 70 countries. We made everything available in 24 languages, which is step number one. And step number two of like adoption is taken over by the local heroes, we call them, the contributors, right? So they are from all the different countries, let's say Croatia, Serbia, Mexico, Italy, USA, Australia, all around the world. And they adjust like the culture aspect. If you even take one topic like air quality, it is differently communicated in every country. So you need a different approach. And we can't do this for our little city like for the globe. So this is taken up by the local communities, right? That set up regular meetups and have a situation that they communicate this topic to the people in their country. And then the last level of adoption is on a local level, because even inside of one country, you have different situations in different cities. One city may have a harbor, like let's say Barcelona or Venice, and then big tourist ships are coming up, and they have like burning heavy oil, so they are generating uh, dead fine particles. Other has, uh, have an airport, or you have like a coal plant. All you have a combination of several situations. Or you're like Stuttgart in a valley with a lot of traffic, right? So we had over the time of the six years hundreds of such calls with local groups saying, my city is the worst. Worse. Like that was always the beginning. And we believed them. But then we have to ask, like, tell us about the situation. How is it? What do we endeavor? How can we approach it, right? Because we have a setup, but maybe we can do some adjustments and we show you how others did it so we can learn from each other. And with these three approaches, with like the focus on language for accessibility, localization in terms of like the culture aspect, how a topic is perceived and communicated, and then the very local approach done also by the very local conversations of these groups. And basically, this is like what made it possible that now we systematically expanded. So we are contacted by groups, 
let's say a good example was 2017 in Bulgaria. They said, we have a really issue with air quality. We don't have like that much data and we maybe do not trust that much to the official station that is uh, stating their data. So we need something in place like you have in your country. So we had a lot of like video conferences back and forth. We discussed, we exchanged and they rolled out a network of around 800 stations in less than eight months. Right, so that's quite uh, something because it took us like a couple of years to get there. So it was really great. And we see the benefit that when we stepped in that they could start at that level where we reached after a longer period of time and they copied all our lessons learned and just rolled it out perfectly. And then we became even better and better in rolling it out. So we've been contacted by communities in Belgium, Netherlands, Poland, and we did the same thing, right? So we had the ramp up from zero to 800. And then if you have such a network, you have a lot of data points, you have a lot of dots on the map where you can look around and pinpoint and say, for example, that's my city. By the way, what makes my life very easy, whenever I uh, present this, I just take a laptop or a uh, tablet, give it into the hands of the people, and I never have to ask where they're from. Because they immediately zoom in their city, in their street, they always want to know, oh, is there sense on your near? Is there something measured? How is the situation just now, right? So that's really, really great that the interest of the people is always given, even if you meet them at international conferences. And you can see here, for example, let's take about the example of the Netherlands. We have a very strong like uh, community here, several communities. And so far we have 1,800 local sensors run, run by the citizen. So what do they do when they discover us? First, you can go to maps.sensor.community where you have the live visualization. And here you have the values that are measured now. And the station are waking up every two and a half minutes, making a new measurement, sending it to our servers, and we do put it into the archive, we make it available through the API, and we visualize it on this map. And this map has a little bit more of functionality. We see on the bottom left the color grade that is linked with the values. And as there are like different definitions from different institutions, we, had made them, we made them available. So for example, you have here also the values for PM10 and PM2.5 in a mean of five minutes. And uh, for example, I will display you the approach of the EU, which is like here, visible. So you see the color grading is different, right? But basically the values are the same. So that is very important because if you consume something like this, you get used to it, right? So it's like we made av available all that we are aware of and that is standardized. But on the other side, people have to understand that, for example, this visualization has a different understanding, makes something different for you when you see like this, right? And for my personal use, for example, prior to the pandemic, when we've been like able to travel much more all over Europe, I basically opened this map Similarly, like if I use the weather app, right? So I check how is the weather, how is the temperature, and also like how is the air quality? Because I'm in a new city, there are other people having a sensor measuring, and I'm checking like, is the situation now good enough that I can go and out and running? Should I go in this park or in that park? And because the situation can also differ from district to district. This map is refreshing itself every two and a half minutes. So the point is that we have a lot of schools that have visible like uh, displays or monitors and they just put in a connection device that can access the internet they open up this map and then it is like visualized and uh, they also focus you can zoom in into your city so let's say for example amsterdam we will look and have a look in there so you select the city and it zooms you in there you see where the locations are and then you have the color grading telling you the current situation. You can also click on one of the tiles and then the list appears with the amount of sensors and the sensor IDs. If you click on the sensor ID, it's like taking out the data from the cache from the archive and is creating this visualization with Grafana for the last 24 hours. So you see like, okay, there was a little bit of a peak, but it was still like below 25, which is kind of good. And here you see also like the situation of the last few days, the up and downs. And people like to check this out very much because there is like extreme situations. Let's say like you have New Year's Eve celebration with the fireworks. Uh, we also hear a lot with the Netherlands that they have uh, high peaks when the Germans have their Easter fires and then with the wind situation, everything comes uh, along. So for example, having the wind layer is very important. And that is like also possible to integrate. So we did it, why not? 
So I will zoom out. Oh yeah, I click here on Europe. And then you can also go in here and you just add the wind layer. So it takes a little bit, it has to load, but you see here is the flow. And you have the stack on the European level. You can also switch on top between like North America. We have stations over there. So shout out to our communities over there. We have really great people that put a lot of efforts into rolling out the first stations there. And it's getting more and more. So we have here also some in South America, the first ones in Africa, Asia, and here. Like we have a really great community in Melbourne that many of us were, they went with the data set to a hacker um, event and made the first place of visualizing it, analyzing it, and they've been very proud what they could do and accomplish with the data. So let me now show you how you access um, the step-by-step -step guides, for example. You go to the website if you are interested not only in data, but actually become a sensor holder. You go to the website, and on the top you have like this point guides, and here you can select air for an air station. And this is what is important to make available in 24 languages, because now you can go step-by-step -step through what you need, these are like the parts to buy. We don't sell them. We don't have a business model. We just make on the website recommendation, please get uh, in your country, it's always differs like what kind of uh, electric um, distributor you have, and get these devices. And mostly we get the feedback that it is uh, a lot in difference of like the, the cost of shipping. So in some countries, it even became more expensive than the parts itself. So roundabout, we can say that the material cost that the contributors put into a sensor kit is like around 50 euros, 50 dollars, 50 pounds. It differs like plus minus one euro um, on where you get it from which distributor. Once you have these parts received and they are lying in front of you on the table, you continue with number two, step number two, which is basically we show you how to get the little software, the firmware, on the little device to make everything work, and you can do it with a Windows computer, a Mac, or a Linux. And we also had like great support from the Polish community because they saw like, oh, you make it so complicated. I have to open this. I have to type in that. Let's make it like a firmware flasher, right? So they wrote a little um, program that makes our life much easier, which you can download. You connect the device. You push the button, and it goes through the process. And it is yeah, big help for the community and for us. So thank you very much to the Polish um, supporters. It um, changed our life and our approach. So then once you install the little firmware, step number three is you take um, the device in front of you, you um, see where is like the first pin and the second pin and so on, and you connect one device like to the other, like these are the parts on top in here. You see this is the sensor that is measuring, this is a little computer that makes everything alive and uh, gets the data and sends it over to our sensor, uh, our server. And uh, this little sensor is a BME 280 that is measuring uh, relative humidity, temperature, and pressure. So we have an indicator on a very local level, wherever you place the air quality sensor, in what kind of environment he is measuring. So because the sensor, as it is having an um, optical approach, so inside there is like a laser beam, and then when the particles pass by, and let's say the humidity is too high, it can be that the water droplets are combining with the dust particles and then there is like a mix-up, right? So it's like you have a detection of wrong values. But you know it when the relative humidity is too high. And institutions like the Health and Environmental uh, Ministry of Netherlands in RIVM, they are familiar with these approaches. And they already published like mathematical correction factors, right? So uh, they actually did a very great job. Um, they took all the data set that we made available historically. They created an own data portal, which is called Samenmeten, like measure together. And they make everything available. They also like make work of our, um, access our APIs. So what comes in, they integrate immediately into their system. They have an own visualization, and they actually are not displaying the raw data like we do on our map, but they have this mathematical correction factor, right? Mm -hmm. And then also in the last step, they even communicate to the citizen, hey, participate at Sensor Community. Whenever they contact them and say like, hey, we are from a small village or a city very far away from the next station. Can you come and measure? And then they tell them, yeah, 
uh, it is big, it is expensive, and to our plans, uh, it will not take place so fast, but if you want something immediately, participate in Zenzo community because we integrate that data into this data portal, where we even go so far that they do have fusion, they take the citizen-generated data, and they take the official network data, and they bring it together, right? But like we said, then they do all the institutional uh, knowledge on top of it, they um, apply like this correction factor when the humidity levels are too high, and all of these approaches are very well documented, right? So it's like, this is very good, and basically they are front runners in collaboration and making this accessible. So also big shout out and big thankful, thank to Eric VM and all the divisions, we had the opportunity to meet with them, to sit down, to listen about their approach, and um, we also could express our plans in the future, because we very much want to go align in how we develop and also how we have the understanding of each other approach, so it can be even integrate much better. They are currently doing it already as a ministry on the national level, but they even go further. There is also an institution that is like called um, Joint Research Center, that's like the technical arm of um, the European Commission. And there, there we have fair mode, which is like um, basically the form of air quality modeling. So there are a lot of experts uh, which like discussing about such topics, and especially in working group number six, they have this approach about these low-cost sensors that are also installed by citizens and how to work with the data. So these institutions are working all with the same data set, but each of them has a different approach when they mix it with satellite data, with weather data, and then they um, have d different aspects on like what do we want to analyze it, and then they have a one-week uh, technical conference where they even present the results and the papers. So what we want to do as sensor community in the future is like that feedback loop, that all what um, the people generate the data, we make it available to them and to the institutions, and the institutions that work with it made us aware about their outcomes, and then we can bring it back to the people that generate the data to make them aware that it's not only that you measure for yourself, it's not only that you measure for others that maybe don't have a sensor, but you're also measuring for the scientific world of these institutions, and look, this is what they found out, and this is how you can benefit from it with having that knowledge, right? So by increasing um, this feedback loop, I think we will strengthen the network and the interest in this uh, generation of the data. And also, more people will have an idea what is possible, but with their knowledge and creativity, they will bring it even further. And to the other approaches that came out of that, uh, we will come in a couple of minutes. So here is a great example. Um, this is the working group with low-cost sensors. It's working number six. You have a description. They're also publishing the results, and they have conferences you can attend. So would like to make you aware about that. And thank you also very much for yours from RFM to yeah create like a lot of uh, great outcomes <laughs> that we learned from. And I will also show you one example what resulted after such a session we've been allowed to attend. So if you go on our main website, um, you can scroll down, and then there is the join a campaign section. And once we uh, accessed one of the uh, conversations they had between the institutions, we understood like, oh, uh, they actually like work with our data. The data that is generated by the sensor community contributor is interesting. But uh, they have also sometimes like a specific approach when they say we only take the data that is very close enough to the official stations, and then we ask about the specific distance. And they say like, yeah, one is 250 meters, and the second one is 1,000 meters. So we thought, very interesting, we didn't know about that. So Pierre, for example, from our core team, he sat down and created another map. This is like sensor to ref map. I will go here on the green bar to make it visible on the full screen. And what it actually displays is that the blue dots are the official reference stations. In Europe, we have a big data set, and then we also access one from Environment Protection Agency in the US. And the red dots are actually sensor community stations. And at the bottom left, you can switch between 250 meters and 1,000 meters. And I will show you like, what the difference is when we go into the search bar. We go, for example, for London. Just out of use, I'm using this uh, example. So we are now in London with the map. It's loading the data. And you see here the blue dots are the official stations. 
and the red dots are the sensor community stations. So we basically create like this circle that is currently 1,000 meters, and then we color grade them based on how many sensors from our network are close enough to be included in this scientific work, right? So, and to connect this and make you understand why we did this is because we have received hundreds of emails from people that are writing us we have built our third sensor, our fifth sensor, our 15th sensor, and now me, my neighbors, my school, my workplace is covered already, but can you let me know where would it be strategically of interest for the collection, for the collective network, to place the next sensor? We need an indicator. So basically, this is the map that we will start with to make people aware about, it would be super interesting to have this red circles, for example, covered with a station, because that would generate data that is then considered and worked with by the institutions. And actually, we have the first examples uh, where we shared the link to this new map, and people really built a sensor, drove there, ring the door and explain the project to random people they didn't know before and convince them, hey, can we actually put this device at your house, at your apartment to measure, and then you are, uh, we will show you how to register and you will be like that point on the map. And they really convinced the first people and they loved it. And then in this local situation, they spread the word, built more by themselves and then also by other neighbors. So we increased that creation of the data that was then used by the institution. So that was like a big success story, and we shared it like also with RIVM, and they liked it a lot. They said like, wow, that's really the power of the community. We didn't thought about it. We should make more use about it, right? So it's like, how about we sit together and we create like a map where we are more aware about our white spots, because we have a bias as an institution, the ministry, right? We go maybe in the urban areas, and you as a community, like we expressed, we as a community, we also have our bias, so we should not only look about like we bring our sensors to your stations and have a co-location and they also see like where is our concentration so they may be in their planning of where to place the next station are looking after that but also take the whole country where are the obvious white spots that none of us is existing right so in one of these examples for example in the north of netherlands uh, it's around groningen there was like also a concession of the university of groningen a local newspaper a local air quality institution, they put the efforts together and they rolled out a network of, I think, around 800 sensors in less than three months. And everybody said, like, why put the sensors there anyway? It's like so strong, the wind is there, the air seems always fine. And now that you have the stations, you have the data, they say, like, oh, actually, that's very interesting what we see. And it's very good to have the data points and look around the whole country, right? So it stepped up that the conversation led to saying, we have certain edge cases like the borders. Every country and every institution all around the world has the border situation where they very, very seldom place stations, right? So, and through this conversation, then that both been in the room, the different divisions of RIVM and us, we ended up that we want to step up about like how many sensors we're rolling out, where we place them, because currently this is just like on wherever the individuals are coming from and they take care about the local approach, but now we are more systematically checking where would it be necessary to have more data points for the science world and to play back the results coming out of it. Okay, so just to show you also the next step, when you make the circles even smaller on 250 meters, you have to zoom in a bit. So you see that's even harder to cover, right? But we even want at some point to get there that even uh, such closeness is like reached with where we place the sensor. In general, you can say every single sensor is very important, and the sooner the better. Um, each station, like the longer time frame you have like for the sensor data, it is a big improvement, and we see it like in the results when it's presented by the institutions. So maybe also to tell you that we do this in the core like as volunteers, so we are uh, <laughs> a handful of people knowing each other's emails basically and having maybe every year one week of holiday less. Um, but we love the project, we believe in it, we um, ensure that it's like uh, safe and uh, can keep going and is expanding. But this all would not be possible at all without all the hundreds of helping hands all around the world. So also we want to use that occasion. And if you see this, uh, we thank you very, very much for all the efforts you do, all the workshops that you run, 
all the explanation that you make and um, yeah, to support um, the wider community of the sensor kit holders. So thank you very much. And also like for everyone who built the sensor and is a sensor community contributor and is generating to the data. And now we also want to let you know that maybe you are not aware, but the data that you generate is feeding this map. And this map is seen by tens of thousands of people. So we have even uh, known that, uh, for a good example, is coming back to Bulgaria. This map is being integrated in a local news uh, website. And then in the morning show, they sometimes let the people know, hi, we have a peak. We have a peak in the city. And we have, like, in, in minutes, we have uh, 86,000 more people opening the map. <laughs> so we, we learned also, like, how to scale up the infrastructure. We have, like, um, re redundancy built in, uh, because we also need sometimes uh, sleep. <laughs> so we have to ensure that uh, this map uh, is always accessible and running. And the, uh, we also see the dependency from the communities that they build on top of it other uh, solutions. So when the service is down also for just a few minutes, because of whatever reason, there is many things that can happen. At the end, it is like an orchestration of 13 different virtual servers uh, creating this, um, making it accessible. Then the community is immediately like letting us know, and um, we also have all the reports what else they are doing with it, right? So there are many like notification systems built, there are chatbots built. I think it was in the Ukraine, they created the chatbot for certain messenger, and they're like, 80,000 people that registered for it to get the notification. Even the network itself is very small. We don't have that many sensors just yet. And it was, of course, uh, prior to the pandemic and the prior to the war, but the interest was there amazing. And um, another thing also very important for us to mention is that we, based on the conversations with the communities, we see a very big potential in like, there's activities that are cross-border. So we try to organize like working groups that are topic driven. For example, they want to set up a different type of sensor. And then we hear the interest from different countries, different cities, and we bring them together. And they collaborate online like it would be in the same room, like it would be their neighbors. And this is like really great to observe when several teams are working together collectively, exchanging, improving. And then we come at a certain point where they come back and say like, okay, we reach a level, we think it is good enough to be now deployed. And that is, for example, the noise sensor kit. So we have a second network where we measure noise. It recently came out of beta. And it was also the approach that uh, at the community event from noise communities, they said like, they contact us and say like, hey, we saw what you did with the air quality topic, how you made it accessible and understandable. We need the same approach for noise, right? We need to have a kit that is much lower in price point. It has to be more accessible. It has to be easier to create by themselves, by the citizen. And then also it has to be communicated in your way, like the archive, the API, the map. So there was like several different approaches in parallel. At the end, it was like a team um, approached very fast. And we have a version that is like not only running up and running and existing, but coming back to RIVM, picked it up. They checked it. And they had a long-term um, testing going on. And now when we had the opportunity to speak with them again, they told us already that the report is very soon before it will be like published and that the results are making them very happy. So they already approached a company in the Netherlands to build 50 of them for them. And then they have placed 25 each in two locations with two different approaches. One is uh, for um, traffic, and the other one is given out to noise sensitive people and to make create like analysis and data and to have like these two reports. That's how the institutions work. For our work, it is like to make such a device available and have this uh, infrastructure accessible so all the different communities can run it. And now let's switch over on the map and see how it looks. So go over here. And here it is, the noise map. So you see we have 250 live devices already from the beginning in several countries. And um, this is like the current situation that you can click the same mechanism. You click on the sensor ID, and then it shows you like the values, right? So currently, we have the three values that we are receiving from the devices. But we want to step up 
it will be like uh, 10 times more. And which one we are now in the discussion with the institutions, because we want to align with what is already known uh, in the scientific world, so that we generate data points that are really like uh, usable for them, and we immediately get to the point where these two worlds are brought together, right? So the citizen approach of rolling out the devices, and the world of science where they have already the knowledge to work with massive data sets and topic specific. So basically we have currently like mentioned two networks. This is the air quality and this is like the noise, which are two different uh, kits and two different approaches. Now I will mention the last one, which is NO2 diffusion tubes. So you come back to the website and you go down to campaigns. By the way, in the last two years, we had many more campaigns. We closed a few because we are in the core like just four people. <laughs> we, we can't do everything. Um, but let me tell you about the NO2 campaign. So for example, we've been in touch with an institution that um, had run a campaign with many diffusion tubes. They are just like little plastic tubes that you place in the height of two, two meters, close to a street, but not close to an intersection. That is the approach that you have. And then they had three, 300 of these tubes left over and they didn't have contacts. And we said, like, no problem. We have people all around the world. Just let us know about the scope. And they said, like, yeah, Europe is a good one. And then we said, immediately phoned around. And here you see we had nine different cities. Uh, we contacted them and they said, like, yes, that sounds very interesting. We want to do that. Can you explain us how? So we had a uh, on conference call online. We teach them about the approach. They've been trained about how to analyze the spots in their cities where to place the sensors. Then they marked them on the map. We played that back to the experts. They made little adjustments because some of the tubes, if you have, for example, for one city, 20 of them, you have to place a handful in living areas for comparison reason. That's how the method works. And also not too close to intersection. That is how the method is set up. So they made the adjustments of the location. We played the data back to the people on the ground. They said, like, yes, understandable, check, check, check. Now we packed these parcels, sent them out to the nine locations in Europe, and the people received the parcels. We had the tracking number, we had the feedback loop from them, and they've been very happy. And then they did walk the dog. They walked the dog around the city, and at the location, they had their documents, and they marked like the location, the exact timestamp, and how it was set up and placed it um, around a pole of a lamp or a location they identified. And then this method is that the tube is staying there for a month. And after a month, they do the walk the dog again. They go and pick it down, write it into the protocol, put it in an envelope and send it to an institution that is analyzing them. To our knowledge, there are three or four in Europe. And this is also the same method that the official institutions we have in each country are doing, right? And this is a chemical approach, but it is like very hard proven. Like you can go and sue uh, the city if their like levels are above uh, certain limits due to however is your <laughs> national regulation. The point is that this approach, many local groups in many different cities are doing, but they stay local. They always do their local crowdfunding campaign, they have a local website, and then they're running out of energy or resources to continue because they have to put all the efforts in finding out how does it work, and 80% of the energy goes into analyzing how to get it done, and actually like the last 20% to make it happen. The point is that many are not informed that it is very important to not run this only for one month, but to have enough for doing it minimum a whole year, right? So that is like changing the validity of all the approach and all the data. So we thought about like, how about we help them with the first part, creating an infrastructure where they can easily like visualize the data, make it accessible, and they don't have to run all an own website declaration and all look different and it's just a local, but to make it visible about all these local approaches together, and we created this map for first our campaign. So this is like the nine um, measurements done by Zenza community local campaigns. And then this map received visibility. So we've been contacted by the other institution that had run measurements with over 6,300 measurements. And they said like, hey, here is the data set. Can you integrate it into your map? Because your map has many more visibility. 
And this is like what we are working on now. So this map will be very much soon released with all the measurements from this institution. And now it is about us to spread the word and make all the existing local groups that run this campaign already and connect. Because all they do is like they send us this piece of paper from the official institution that analyzed it. We contact them, we approved. This is like real data, and then we upload it and publish it, make it available there. So basically to put all the local um, efforts from all the hundreds of little groups on a platform where they get more visibility and they can exchange about the approach and become better and better. To basically coordinate our collaboration, right? And this is like receiving currently a very strong feedback uh, from the communities. They like it a lot. And then they think that the efforts that they put in the first to roll it out at all, they can put now in the continuation. So we have the first communities that continued the measurements and are now in month 15 and month 18. And they are very happy about it, right? So, and they ensured that even the, until the end of the second year, they have enough resources to exchange the, the tubes. And it is like a very strong data set that they can now then build on with their cases and the work. So basically, this is like our current situation that we have the air quality network with 14,000 uh, station generated over 18 point billion data points. We have the second network with the noise with 250 stations that is out of beta and is now expanding and growing. And also the ministry like RIVM said, this is like very good approach. We want to use it. We want to build on top of it. And we have the proven NO2 diffusion tube method that is already done by many local groups, but to not stack the knowledge and the values on a local base, we now giving them the offer to add their values to the map and make it visible for the collective for all. So I want to close this presentation with giving you like hints in maybe you are in different uh, situation, different interest fields, how you could like become a member of community, sensor community. So basically you are already when you opening maps.sensor community and you are checking the values close to yourself, like wherever you live and see it and treat it like something that is given. It should be everywhere. It should be like the weather forecast, right? So consume the data. It is refreshed every two and a half minutes. And um, you will see if there are extreme values, you will consider, OK, what can I change? And then you will have to ask like all the local groups, what is impacting uh, the values? Where does it come from? What can we do? And this sparks like new conversation, new approaches. If you want, you can also like build and operate a sensor yourself. So how to do that is like you go to the main website and go to guides and follow the step-by-step -step approach with first receiving the parts, second putting them together, uh, installing the firmware, registering, and then you're becoming a point on the map. And now that we are at the hacker conference, like we thank you very much because we receive so much support from the hacker community. Uh, they go to GitHub, they check um, the publish, like the tools, and they push code and improvements to us and help us make this happen and possible. So without all the help, we would not be here. The network would not be here. So therefore, we want to end with a big thank you. And also, thank you, everyone, taking place here in the presentation. I will be available outside of the tent for conversations because we have already like a lot of approach and uh, people want to discuss. So thank you very much for coming. And yeah, we hope we can serve you well. Uh, let us know how to improve by messaging us. The contact details on the website and looking forward for the conversations. Thank you.